I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the North Wind Reading Series takes place on the ancestral homelands of the Sklalem and Shimakum nations who have cared for these lands since time immemorial and continue to do so today. We are grateful for their ongoing stewardship of these lands and waters. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our first reader tonight, Sharon M. Carter, who co-curated the Northwind Reading Series with us at the beginning, and she demonstrated her genius for working with sound system controls at our very first live readings, and we were so grateful. Sharon M. Carter grew up in a Lancashire seaside resort. She studied medical sciences, attending Cambridge University and St. Mary's Hospital Medical School in London. Trained in family practice, she completed a psychiatry residency. She retired from a part-time volunteer medical position four years ago, having worked for nonprofits in both countries. The Hedgework Foundation and Jack Straw Writers Program generous, generously provided valuable support during her early writing career. She has been a co-editor of an online literary magazine and assisted this reading series in really essential ways at its inception. Her visual art and poetry have been published in many print magazines and online, including the Raven Chronicles award-winning anthology, Take a Stand, Art Against Hate. Exhibition, Pontoon, Poetry on the Buses, Ars Medica, Terra Nova, and Heliotrope. Her chapbook, Quiver, is at the printers, and we look forward to seeing it. Please welcome Sharon M. Carter. Yeah. Well, thank you, Holly and Linda, for inviting me to read tonight, especially with my friend Sheila. Lovely, and everyone for joining us on Zoom. Uh, most of the poems I'm going to read are from the book Quiver with a few extras. Um, it will be published by Teapot Bark, which means little teapot in Welsh. And for the publication date, um, please enter your email address in the contact box on my website. SharonMCarter.com. Thank you. So, um, the first poem I'm going to read um, is what I call one of my bug poems, insect poems, and it refers to a Paleolithic cave in northern Spain, and it's called El Pindle Cave Asturias. The sun delivers opals to the morning sky, cicadas. High up in eucalyptus, drum their release from damp earth and root sap. Our trail crunches from the ghostly litter of their discarded shells, winds along cliffs to caves where a screen of vines defines the boundary between light and dark. A cerebric bulldog dozes in the heat, head slumped on a platter of paws. His eyelids shutter as we approach. Tourists emerge into daylight, resurrected from the underworld, no longer silent as shed skin, unable to speak their names. And the second poem is also an inset poem and suggested the book title and it's called Imagine. A tongue recently due by plum blossom unfurls from a honeybee who believes your mouth an orchid. So fine, it might thread a needle. So long, it unravels in your mouth, probing your tonsils, lingular palate. She lingers on your lips, gilding your voice with pollen. In time, you will learn to open with ease. Allow your tongue to rest lightly on lower lip, a slight quiver at its tip. And the companion poem to this is called Honeybee the Latin name being Hymenoptera. 
honeybee. Tired of pollen legs, more butterfly than bee. He wanted stained glass wings. Sip, not chew. To trespass mouth's pillowed lips, the hinge of teeth. Unfurl a swallowtail's tongue. Explore every pool and pocket of this new world. Don't we all wish for more than we have sometimes? I've always lived near the ocean, except when I first arrived in the US. And my hometown, Morecambe, is situated on a very large bay in the North Sea, which is notorious for its deceptive tides. The other thing is the sea temperature is between 50 degrees and 54. And when I was a child, I used to swim in it. Um, and the, but the poem is called Non-Native. Earthworms digest my garden detritus. The same species dug in my childhood yard for bait. I learned to hook those pale tremblers myself. Wait for hook tugs on my handheld line. We caught eels from the jetty on their journey to mate in Bermuda's Sargasso Sea. I remember the wind lash off Morecambe Bay. Fish heads, blood. Walking home, the catch dangled like Medusa's scalp from dad's calloused hand. Caught in the same bay, 23 illegal Chinese cockle pickers were swallowed by incoming tides while paying off their debts. And the companion to this poem is called The Earthworms Speak. And their Latin name is Alolo Buffer. And this is their immigration story. The earthworms speak, Lolo Buffer. Dragged from one land to another, we burrowed in, swallowed their foreign ways. Our skin repelled them. What difference could that make? Misery enough to drive us west across the plains. Here we return to our industrious ways. These neighbors, more accepting, but still jealous of our gorgeous name. This poem is about a backpacking trip. Um, doesn't seem that long ago, but I know I couldn't climb 2000 feet in three quarters of a mile with a full backpack now. Um, we set off too late and we stumbled over the lip of the pass into this scene and it's called Asgard Pass, Alpine Lakes Wilderness, which leads to the enchantments. Stars puncture an indigo night. Our footsteps clatter in couplets over granite boulders glittering horn blend fused with quartz. At the pass, our plume breath rises into ice scape. The moon, a milky white cataract in sky's retina. My ax fractures a frozen lake. Cracks radiate, probe the black veneer like the blight on your mammogram the shock of cold water. I carve a smooth, clean circle, fill steel pans. We pitch tent, unfurl sleeping bags, our spines pressed to the earth as we pivot toward morning. I think I'll read a medical poem now. In my life as a family physician, 
I attended clinics in Welsh coal mining areas. And uh, these once attractive valleys are now filled with slag heaps and, and such. Um, there was a famous uh, book written called How Green Was My Valley and a movie in 1941 that actually won more Oscars, I think, than Citizen Kane. Just a little fact there. The poem's called The Doctor in Coal Country. Slag heaps backdrop our clinic. Hunched labor from another history. We live in coal country. Poverty, pit deaths, black lung. The boy appears after hours. An eight-year-old sapling, swollen thumb. A needle-sized sliver spears his nail into the pulp. A pus bee gleams at entry. By now, all sobbing has passed, his digit beyond tweezers and patience. A red line reaches for his armpit, for his life. His flushed face turns toward me, fever, not summer heat. He turns, trusting. I gave him antibiotics. That's what they're for. And the next medical poem is, um, it's a strange situation where um, I recognized a serious medical problem on the telephone and had to send my father back to his doctor for more than cough syrup. And it's called The Diagnosis for James Carter, 1921 to 1999. Over the phone, I hear birdsong rise from his throat. Unfamiliar whistles and wheezes at sentence ends. When asked about his lung chirps, he cracks a lame bagpipe one-liner. Prolonged hacking ensues. He says, daffodils and forsythia are in bloom. Robin's nest in his window box. Three blue eggs. I think I'll read um, some astronomy poems. Um, they are not in the book, this is new work. Um, Someone asked me how I got interest, interested in astronomy and um, I, I think I'll answer this and say, well, um, in pregnancy, some people, some women crave food. Um, in my first, I learned how to spin and weave. And with the second, I bought a telescope. So that's my story, how I got into astronomy. So the first poem is called Star Turns. One, Star Magnolia. Long white petals unfurl, not given to longevity or seductive scent. Efficiently thin, barely holding onto their place in the magnolia family. Barely a star at all. Two. Star Ruby. Let it be the jewel that someone finds at the theoretical limit of our universe before it turns back on itself or joins another in a place where everyone's socks or lost keys gather, but a deserving person who's down on luck trips over its polished, polished mass and exclaims delight. And the second poem is um, called The Queen of Hearts in the Asteroid Belt. And she's much nicer in space than she is on Earth, but barely. The Queen of Hearts. Centuries since her banishment, the bright distant stars still remind her of spring apple blossom, croquet balls, 
planetary moons, here among the asteroids and rarefied air, she has perspective on her previous rage. How the dwarf planet's quiet rotations calm her furious red heart, especially Pluto, himself a once angry king demoted from the solar system. His slow revolution around the sun lulls her into sleep. Today, a picnic on the Mare Nectaris. Tomorrow, bowling solar debris through Saturn's rings. She knows she'll decline if re-invited home. Its frenetic pace, its smallness would get on her nerves. And the last poem, is called Door to Another Universe. During college, I embarked on uh, shoestring vacations, which involved a lot of hitchhiking. So I traveled all over Europe. I feel lucky and grateful. So here's the poem. Barely a moon when the truck pulled into Madrid. I gambled on safety. The world seemed mine back then. Descended the bar's damp steps. The audience of broken bottles, butt ends. Doors open to smoke, men, a flamenco guitarist in embroidered vest. The dancer, dressed as a crimson sunset, strutted on a pocket-sized stage. Her leather heels drumming a tachycardia. When rhythmic clapping began, she arched her body, snapped open castanets, a dueling conversation overlaid by staccato bursts of dancing. The performers halted on the same pulse. She flipped back her hair, creating her own dark galaxy and laughed. Thank you very much. Those were wonderful, Sharon. Thank you so much. Um, I wrote, I was thinking about how rich your work is and I'm so looking forward to having your book in my hands and reading it and um, also hearing more of your astronomy poems. Um, those poems just took me on a journey of these close in and far places and other lives. Just wonderful. Thank you so much. You're very kind. Thank you. Okay, so next up is Sheila Bender. And um, Sheila is the founder of writingitreal.com, a website dedicated to facilitating writing from personal experience in all genres. Her poems appear in many journals, recently in Unstomatic, Griffel, The Lake. Showbear Family Circus, A Room of Her Own Foundation, and now forthcoming in Empty Bowls, The Madrona Project's third anthology. Her previous books include the poetry collection Behind Us, The Way Grows Wider, and a memoir, A New Theology, Turning to Poetry in a Time of Grief. Her new book of poems, Since Then, Poems and Short Prose, will be out from Ex Ophidia Press in 2022. And she's pleased to have helped coordinate the Northwind Poetry Reading Series and produce the program in conversation, discussions of writing. And the welcome, Sheila. Thank you, Linda. I want to thank you as well as uh, Holly and you. And I want to tell our audience, thank you for being here. But also, um, I want to thank Holly and Linda, especially for the way they kept poets engaged in having to do various things in order for us to keep the series going, from recording themselves to re-recording themselves, um, all kinds of things, to learning how to do it in the first place, all kinds of things happened. And um, I wanna thank my husband, Kurt Vanderslice for the editing he's done and the way he's encouraged people at times to re-record and get things better when their networks are more stable. So with that, I wanna tell you that the poems I'm reading from the manuscript since then, poems and short prose, 
which is coming from Exophidia Press in Seattle, um, are all poems from that manuscript. And the poems in the book started when my 25 year old son died at the end of 2000 in a, snow a snowboarding accident. And I pretty quickly started to write poems. They weren't finished, they maybe weren't very good, but it was what I had to do. And these 21 years later, um, I find that the poems have helped me catch up with myself, catch up with where grieving has brought me. And I don't think they're depressing. I just think they're sobering. And I wanna say that we all are living in a time of shared grief. We've all lost loved ones, colleagues, just because of age and illness and also because of COVID. We've lost whole lifestyles, so many things. So I think writing is a great ally for us in um, weaving our way through new circumstances. So um, I'm gonna start with a poem written after a painting in an exhibit years ago when uh, Northwind Art was Northwind Gallery. And it, we, as a series, always had a yearly ekphrastic event where poets were invited into the gallery to view the exhibit at a quiet time when it wasn't normal open hours and choose a poem or sometimes more and write in response to the poem, which is what ekphrastic writing is, as many of you know. So this one is called in the room of mourning, and it's after a painting called All Our Sorrows by our own Port Townsend Nancy Van Allen. Sorrow is your guardian. She's got your back, watches as you sit on grief's hard bench under a ceiling so high, warm air cannot encircle you or fill the space where memories are frozen. She'll spin away sometimes, then return to help you choreograph all that is newly ferocious and freshly wild. There's nothing like your first deep grief to change everything seemingly about you and about how you're living and what you're perceiving. The next poem was written during another Port Townsend project, this time uh, a collaboration be between poets and visual artists, all of this obviously before the pandemic. My group met in Jim Murphy's artist studio, which was in the living space of his home on Hastings and open to the kitchen, which I was sitting next to. And that's what inspired the poem called Reload for Seth Bender, 1975 to 2000. I load the dishwasher, washing machine, pantry, while grief sweeps shards of a shattered moon. I go for a drive into sunlight and she scrambles into the passenger seat beside me. Once my son drank milk from a half gallon carton before my eyes. Once he picked out a dining room fixture and installed light for us. Once he caulked our sink. Once we were short of breath together in the Rockies and once we rode mountain bikes up curbs. Once he said his sister's reading made him bored and then he went to college and began to enjoy books. Grief does not smile with me. She listens to every wishful breath in and tearful one out. As a writing instructor, I read a lot, I read a lot of works online that I think will encourage my students because of strategies that the poets are using and sometimes the prose writers. And by copying those strategies, they will write some fresh work themselves since sometimes I do the exercises myself. And this one is for my father. How to grieve your father. Sit on the bench donated in your son's name. He died six months before your father died from Parkinson's. The bench invites you to reflect as the sun rises over the bay. Your son was sunrise, your father sunset. Your cousin told you your father said it should have been him. Look at dawn lighting the sky with pink and yellow colors of long ago doll's clothes. Remember, your father taught you to declutter the room you shared with your sister. Do you need this and this? Where does this belong? Those things out of place, 
those things with no place, like your too soon grief over your father's passing. Think of the day you sat on a toilet lid watching him shave. Suddenly the building sewer backed up. He fled to work telling your mother to rise from bed and call a plumber. Know that you cannot clean or declutter grief. Know that you may want to walk away from its mess because one memory begets another, like objects you would put in a treasure box if you had one and knew where it belonged. When I did resume teaching after Seth died, which was months later, grief was still always a moment away in my feelings and thoughts for years, and it influenced my writing. And I took the opportunity often to write while the students were writing, which was a little tricky because if my poem made me sad, I still had to go on and teach. But better to feel your real feelings, we as poets think, than to repress them. And this was written from my experience teaching at the Writers' Workshop in Port Townsend and uh, sitting quietly looking at the wall that was a distance away from me while the students wrote. In the writing workshop, a calendar cover pinned to the far wall proclaims divine comedy, pictures a ghost or an angel, maybe a priest in white robes, who can tell from where I sit. Next to the cover, a page of April's dates tilts right with a graphic of boots wrapped in low fog. Do I make out a starry sky above? Time is not linear, they say, though our lives mostly are. If I reach into the jumble of days with coffee, if I reach into the jumble of days, will coffee still drip in the red pot? My feet still touch the classroom's brand new floor. There's a very unreal aspect to grieving. You feel like you're quite a different place and that you're actually in a familiar place as well. So after the Poets and Visual Artists project culminated and, after, and before the pandemic, Sharon and Holly and Linda and Gail Canning, who's here tonight, and I created a project of our own. We decided to visit local spots of interest and write poems from the notes we took and the experiences we felt in each. And this is what I wrote uh, from my experience at Kai uh, Tai, which was one of the places we went. And Holly led us on a brief nature walk and we talked about what was growing there. And then we stood in various places and began to take notes. Who lives on the other side? Who lives on the other side of the pond in the house I see through a corkscrew willow? Who lives on the other side of years since I owned a house with a corkscrew willow, since I sold its branches once a year to one florist a block around the corner, then two more down the street, since I was raising children who loved two kittens, one Seth called Midnight, the other Emily's Melissa, since Midnight was stolen from our yard and Seth absorbed his loss and his sister's good fortune, since a coyote destroyed the quails he kept in a backyard pen, only gray feathers left. Since Seth was stolen by, from us by the icy slopes of Breckenridge, one winter's sunboarding run. Who lives on the other side of my grief, regular as sunset, hungry as deer in early spring, nibbling buds on the drooping branches of that corkscrew willow? I stand before a windbreak of poplar trees, viewing a house on the other shore, as if whoever lives there will open its quiet door. And now I'm going to switch to a happy memory of my dad from my childhood. And uh, it's called Wrapping Coins Accumulated in an Aluminum Camping Pot. For Bert Lillian, February 20th, 1927 to May 7th, 2001. Once we counted coins, Dad, from a ceramic bank you'd filled for years. It was bright red, a couple of feet tall, a fire hydrant replica, 
How like you, I realize now, to have not a pig, but something familiar as growing up in Brooklyn. I hear again the drop of coins into the slot at the top of your bank. My old question, is it filled yet? There was no plug at the bottom. You had to hammer it open. It was fun to watch you shatter it, destroying something instead of maintaining it with the care usual for you. Then to start filling the paper tube, I had to get the first coin to lay flat against my forefinger slipped inside. And when I filled it with 50 pennies, it felt like a woven Chinese finger trap when I had to get my finger out. As I fill my paper wrappers now, I hear your words, loose change, small change, no small potatoes. I must have made a call to heaven there at my table today, remembering listening to bag bagpipe music on a vinyl record you bought from the sale bin at the A&P, teaching me that change equals dollars and bargains can expand horizons. When Kurt wakes up just now, he sees the wrapped coins and tells me he's read that the chance of winning the lottery is less than the chance of dropping a penny from the top of the Empire State Building into a cup placed on the sidewalk. And I imagine not one coin, but a skyscraper full of them, the silvery sound of a young me and my young father and a table full of wealth. So another thing about grieving is that eventually you do remember the memories that made you really, really happy. And another thing about grief is that we often travel in order to see if that will help. We think we can get away from our grief by finding a new circumstance, a new environment, and seeing what it brings. And it does bring, I think, sometimes a little peace, a little break, but the hiatus is often very brief. And this is a poem about that. From a summer that I was invited by my daughter and her husband to be nanny to their two young boys for a month while they were still working in Denmark on a sabbatical and the boys were out of their international school classrooms and needed someone to be with them all day. So there was grandma. But there was some time I was by myself when the family went to Paris to meet another family and I stayed in Aarhus where they were, out wandering Aarhus, Denmark. When the wind blusters behind me and the hair at the back of my head rushes toward my face, I imagine a white line of scalp revealed like this sandy path lined by sea buckthorn and I don't think of the coming storm. The next poem I'm going to read is a pantoum, and uh, it's connected to this reading because one of the things we did was visit Northern Jutland in Denmark to, as my daughter said, stand in the water where the Baltic Sea meets the North Sea. She thought that would be an intriguing thing to do and especially interesting for her kids. So my grandson, the youngest one of the two, had given me a book earlier for my birthday called A Kick in the Head. And it's a child's book for writing poetry in um, form. And he said to me when he gave it to me, Grandma, I know you're gonna like this book because my school has it. He was in third grade. So I brought the book with me to Denmark thinking maybe it would encourage me to write some poems in form, which isn't usual for me. And it did, and I encourage you all, if you don't know what a pantoum is, to look it up online, P-A-N-T-O-U-M, pantoum. And especially to take a look at that book. It's still available, I've seen it, a kick in the head. Pantoum from Northern Jutland for Emily and VJ, who took me there. At the top of Jutland, Jutland I'm gonna start again. And I meant to tell you, you'll get what a pantoum is by listening to the pattern of the repeated lines as I go down through the poem. At the top of Jutland, where two seas meet, my daughter and her family and I stand with one of our feet in each of the seas to see which of the two is the coldest. My daughter and her family and I take our time before we put in our votes about which of the two is the coldest. We know it is a very close match. We take our time before we put in our votes. My oldest grandson leans toward the Baltic 
though the two are a very close match. More sun seems to polish the North Sea's ripples. My oldest grandson sticks with the Baltic, Baltic. As a baby, he flinched in slight breezes. The sun warms the shallower ripples. I vote just as he does. As a baby, he flinched in breezes by windows. I look at the smile made by the swirls of the waves. And I vote now as he does, awed by his height, how he's taller than I am. I look at the smile made by the swirls of the waves, how the two seas seem a slit in a skirt. And my grandson is taller than I am. My daughter says, not a slit, but a zipper. I see the two seas as a slit in a skirt, in a skirt while I stand in the sand in the small space between. My daughter says, not a parting, a zipper. Three generations fastened by waves in the water. While I stand in the sand in the small space between, my daughter proclaims not a parting a zipper, three generations fastened by waves and by water, and I stand in the sand smiling among them. Before I end, I have two more poems. Um, my mother recently died, as many of you know, on October 25th. And although I haven't really written about her other than in a eulogy and an obituary, which you might have seen in the leader. I know I will. For now, I'd like to read a poem that I wrote for her when she was the caregiver for my father who had Parkinson's and I was living in LA where it was always sunny and we were always bike riding. I think of my mother caring for my father with Parkinson's one Wednesday afternoon. How easily I think back to those years, me in the first grade, tromping around in my mother's navy blue heels, watching her lipstick rise from its sheath with a twist of her fingers, her compact ch chirping shut. When did she stop using lipstick, the red of the bougainvillea outside my window? From the years between then and now comes the scent of lilac bushes planted at each new home the dogs named Fanny and Butch, Pledge and Pride, products we dusted with, the way we shrunk from the gurgle and hiss of mother's steam iron, thud it made against the cotton wrapped board, smell of heat on quiet cloth. Two, Saturday after a morning bike ride. Home now after 30 miles of sun in my eyes and the far off Santa Monica mountains beckoning like a voluptuous woman in evening dress, houses like sequins on her full length gown, a village of houses like the one my mother wanted when I was 11. I remember my sister and me with bowls full of ice cream on shaky folding snack trays in front of the couch, Jackie Gleason on TV, his small city apartment, something my parents had come from. My father at the kitchen table with columns of numbers to buy the house, how much from here and from there and from their parents, how much the interest on how many loans. Three, Sunday morning. I raise the blinds, see sunlight on the bougainvillea this late December, its branches grown laden with blossoms. I want to give my mother back the red lipstick, the day she bought pistachio ice cream my mother loved, shopping trips to buy the howdy duty spoons we ate it with, the chartreuse couch, the window to raise and yell at my father for doing his paperwork in his parked car, not ready to come in. I want to give her back mornings he adjusted his tie, asking if he looked presentable. The other words he often said, nobody is indispensable. The way we knew it wasn't true. And when you lose somebody, they are indispensable for always. And I'm gonna end now with a poem I wrote during the pandemic. And it is inspired by walking to my mailbox, which is about a mile from my house, through streets that were so quiet with nobody outside. And it triggered memories of a very opposite situation in childhood when the streets were noisy and full of people at play and in conversation. Evening song. In the quiet, you hear the bird song that drove you once so quickly from the family dinner table to play in hours left of daylight. Hit the penny on the head, pink rubber ball you held a yard from where the penny lay on your front sidewalk. 
or other nights hopped big squares your friends had chalked while parents chatted happy on porch steps. Sometimes if the light lasted, you rode your bike to a seemingly far field, empty and full of possibility, then rode back at twilight to the comforting glow of parents' cigarettes in the coming dark. This evening, you walk deserted streets accompanied by music of those birds, so close, so far away, and notice the moochie pines in neighbors' front yards, how thick, dark green this year's spring candles have become, pointing as they do toward the magnificent and timeless sky. I wanna thank you very much for being here and listening to both of us. It's been a pleasure. Oh, thank you, Sheila. Yeah, those, that was a beautiful, what a beautiful reading. I, I just am so grateful for your skill and courage in being able to go into grief and take us with you. Those are very powerful poems. I, I've heard the one about Seth before, and every time I hear it, it just makes me tear up. Um, yeah, and I love the story about you writing poems um, while you were at the writer's workshop and your ability as a teacher um, to be able to be working on your own work and what you model for your students in doing so, I think is so important. Um, and I love the pantoum. That was a beautiful use of that form. And so I hope those of you who haven't tried it before might be inspired by Sheila's pantoum and give it a try. So thank you so much for coming. Anything you want to add, Linda? No, just thank you so much for being here and supporting these poets and poetry in our community and beyond. It's been a challenge and a pleasure these last two years. Bye.